corrupted while attempting to rebuild their legion after the Istvan massacre, the Raven Guard have dedicated their lives and souls to Zinj, the god of change. Flesh follows desire, as bone and armor is molded in the wings and claws. Even before their fall, the legion was able to strike from the darkness to end battles before they even began. Now, guided by their powerful sorcerers, they are able to manipulate the fates of entire worlds. When the infant Primarchs were scattered across the galaxy, most came to rest on worlds outside the bounds of the growing Imperium. The infant Korax, though, landed on a moon orbiting a planet that had recently brought into compliance, yet there was no way for the Emperor to know that his lost son was already within his domain. The pale youth was found on Lysaeus, an airless mining moon orbiting the world of Kiavar. Unfortunately, the Imperium's presence on the planet extended a little beyond a handful of officials, sent to ensure that the ruling tech guild kept up the flow of equipment and weapons to nearby expeditions. Lysaeus was a penal colony, with the mines worked by criminals and dissidents opposed to Kiawar's rulers, to be shipped up to Lysaeus was a life and death sentence combined. As the backbreaking labor, bad air and ever-present risk of cavens meant that life was ugly, brutish and short. Protests were quickly stamped upon by the guards, backed up with ultimate sanction that if unrest ever became too vocal, the four stones that enclosed the settlements would be deactivated and the unruly elements vented to open space. The boy Primarch was found by the convicts who recognized something exceptional about him. They hid the child from guards and named him Korax or the Deliverer. So certain were they that he held the key to their salvation. This vision was shared by Korax, who from an early age had dreams of a vast winged presence, a raven that guided him in times of trouble and spoke of a great destiny to protect mankind from its enemies. The first steps on his long road were to free the downtrodden population of Lysaeus from their brutal masters. Despite the sickly surroundings, Korax matured rapidly to become a warrior of superhuman proportions. As he did so, the convicts taught him all manner of techniques honed in Kiawar's criminal underworld. Tactics such as sabotage, misdirection, intimidation, and assassination would be vital in freeing them from the iron grip of their jailers, and Korax put all these skills and more to use. It was clear that they could not hope to match their overlords in open combat, as the only weaponry they possessed were mining tools and machinery. Korax clinically analyzed his enemies' weaknesses and constructed an ingenious plan to bring about their demise. Through a subtle campaign of sabotage, Korax's followers steadily increased the pressure on the guards without ever drawing their wrath. The prisoners' mining skills were invaluable in this, first in gaining access to restricted areas and later to outflank and surround their enemies. A series of accidents at the spaceport grounded much of Kiawar's small fleet of mining shuttles which saw the guards' tours and shifts constantly extended as their replacements were trapped on the planet below. By the time Korax's revolution finally ignited, the Wardens were exhausted, disgruntled, and easy prey. The greatest threat came from the towering Black Mountain from which their overlords ruled the moon. But it too was neutralized when the defenders found their control of the Four Stones had been subverted. Their attempts to vent the rioting prisoners into space only resulted in their fortress's blast doors grinding open and the Four Stone over the tower failing flushing the guards themselves into space. Incensed by the rebellion, the rulers of Kiavar used their remaining shuttles to carry military forces up the gravity wall. They fared no better than the guards before them and were torn apart by Korax's grim-faced rebels. 
made all the more deadly by the weaponry taken from their former warders. Finally, recognizing the seriousness of the threat they faced, the leaders of the Tet Guilds called for aid from the Imperium to put down the revolt. Without access to their moon's mineral resources, the forges would rapidly fall cold, and the expeditions they supplied would soon falter. The Imperial fleet arrived with creditable haste, heading directly for the turbulent moon, and after only a brief time, the heads of the tech guilds were curtly informed that the rebellion was at an end. When the Imperial flagship's landing craft touched down at Kiavar's main spaceport, the rebel leader was brought out not in chains, but emerged proudly as a victor alongside none other than the Emperor himself. All assembled fell to their knees before the Master of Mankind, who proclaimed Korax as his son on the man who would from that day onwards rule the Kiavar system in his stead. Cowed by this edict and the Legion of Astartes placed under Korax's command, the now subservient Tekdios were given the task of providing arms and armor for his new Raven Guard. Conditions for the miners were dramatically improved, and the Moon of Lysaeus now renamed Deliverance for Korax's achievements, became the Legion's home, the forbidding black tower that had been the symbol of the tech guild's power was reinforced and expanded to become the Legion's fortress monastery and named the Raven Spire. It has been suggested that the Great Raven in Korax's dreams was a manifestation of the Emperor reaching out to find him. Certainly, after father and son were reunited, Korax was rarely visited again by this mysterious presence. At Ulanor, Korax famously asked his father about this phenomenon, but ever enigmatic. The Emperor simply smiled, knowing. Even with the power of a legion of Astartes at his disposal, Korax continued to follow the precepts with which he had been brought up. He trained his commanders to observe the enemy, to strike at the place they were the most vulnerable, and to cripple their ability to strike back, while some Primarchs used their forces as a bludgeon to bring girls to compliance. The Raven Guard were the rapier of the Legio and Astartes. Because of this, the Raven Guard rarely needed to operate in large groups. Instead, they spread themselves out across dozens of expeditionary campaigns alongside many other legions. Indeed, it is said the reason Horus claimed so many victories was because he so readily used the Raven Guard crack open the defenses of worlds which his own legion then followed up and took credit for liberating. In other cases, though, the cultural differences were just too great. Korax had forbidden the creation of a psychic librarium within his legion, and considered that the way the Thousand Sons embraced their burgeoning psychic potential bordered upon sorcery. He forbade the Raven Guard from fighting alongside them and even spoke out against Magnus at his trial at Nicaea. The other legion the Raven Guard went out their way to avoid was the Imperial Fists. Rogel Dorn's disdain for tactics he deemed dishonorable was legendary, publicly decrying camouflage as being the color of cowardice. It is not clear if offense was intended or if it was simply part of Dorne's brash insensitivity. But in the wake of such pronouncements, the Raven Guard saw fit to remove themselves from the Imperial Fist-led campaigns. Despite this, the list of worlds brought into the Imperium thanks to the Raven Guard's subtle application of military pressure continued apace. The fortress system of Sangramor had withstood within three months of arriving Korax's legion succeeded in isolating and crippling the system's rulers. With the planetary confederation fractured, 
the system's planets easily fell one after another and accepted the Emperor's rule. Their mastery of warfare was not restricted to battling human societies, either. When the Tanabur subsector was threatened by a massive orc uprising, the Raven Guard were able, through assassination and sabotage, to kill and discredit the most troublesome leaders without detection. The inevitable squabble for power stalled the orcs long enough for the Imperium to amass a large enough force to exterminate the Xeno threats once and for all. With the future of his Imperium seemingly assured, the Emperor withdrew to Terra, but before he did, he called his sons together at Nikea. Evidently, Korax was not alone in his concerns over Magnus, who stood accused of pushing beyond the boundaries of the psychic and into the forbidden realms of sorcery. One after another, Russ, Mortarion, Korax, and even Dorn spoke out against their brother. The Raven Guard were not the only legion to have rejected the librarians, and at Nikea, the nature of psychic ability itself was put on trial. On the night before the Emperor rendered his judgment, Korax's dreams were again visited by a giant bird. Rather than a comforting presence, it was troubling and elusive, an indistinct figure spied out of the corner of his eye. This disturbing omen presaged the Emperor's decision, which not only allowed the legions with certain precautions to continue the use of psychics, but went further and gave significant concessions to the Thousand Sons. Magnus was to be personally instructed by the Emperor in the subtle arts of the psychic, and could pass this knowledge on to his legion. In return, he and his marines would submit the soul-binding process by merging their essences with that of the Emperor. It was claimed they would be shielded from the horrors and temptations of sorcery. This compromise did little to allay the fears of the most skeptical Primarchs and led to bloodshed later. Yet the Emperor seemed blind to the resentment it caused. The Primarchs returned to their legions to continue the Great Crusade. Under Horus's stewardship as War Master, the list of worlds under the Emperor's dominion continued to grow, but without his presence, a sense of malaise set in. This found form when the War Master himself was struck down by a sickness and was unable to respond to the stories coming from the Eastern Fringe that Robute Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, was about to secede from the Imperium. With War Master Horus indisposed, Rogodor, in his role as the Emperor's Praetorian, assembled a fleet sufficient to bring the massive Ultramarine Legion to heel. Along with many others, the Raven Guard was one of the legions summoned in their entirety to the Istvan system. Gilliman's new Ultramar Segmentum composed a sizable portion of the Galactic East, and in their relative seclusion the Ultramarines had grown to vast proportions to oppose them. Fully half of the Lejuane Astartes had been called to the task with seven alone assembled to strike at Gilliman, in his forward base of Istvan V, though disturbed that it could have come to brother fighting brother, and worse, doing so at the command of Rogel Dorn, Korax approached the task with his casual analytical nature. His offers to aid in the planning of the assault were brushed aside by Dorn, whose own skill at siege-breaking was legendary. Korax was dismissively informed that Dorne would lead the first wave of four legions to make planetfall. They would weaken the Ultramarines, while the Raven Guard, World Eaters, and the Emperor's children waited in orbit, ready to strike the killing blow. On the eve of the attack on Istvan, as often happened at times of great turmoil, Korax's dreams were visited once again, as on Nikea, the presence was elusive and it did not reveal itself, but this time, it spoke to him. 
Korax had been counseled by the Raven countless times before, and so the warning that the Legion faced a great disaster chilled him to the core. Korax's journal describes the dream. I beg the figure to show itself, to explain what must be done, to avert this terrible fate. From behind me I heard a stretching of claws, and a shingle of law, and turned to see, not the raven that had guided me in my youth, but a thing far more like a vulture in aspect, the creature's pelted bile, hissing that the emperor had forsaken me, but that the lives of my men could be saved if I denounced my father and decided body and so, to the god of change. I confess to be so revolted and stunned that I could not speak, perhaps mistaking my silence for consideration of its offer. The thing came closer and asked again, if I would betray my father. Never, I shouted and pushed it roughly away. It reared up into the air, plumage flushing pale blue, and fixed me with its evil, malevolent gaze. In a sibilant hiss, it claimed that I would run like a coward on the battlefield of Istvan, and consign my legion to utter ruin. I picked the stone from the ground, and pouring it all my revulsion and anger, cast it at the Operation. It caught the vulture in one of its hateful blue filmed eyes, provoking it into a fit of screeching curses. His final threat of Nemo me impune lacessit, or No one attacks me with impunity, echoed in my ears long after I awoke. Disturbed by the dream, Korax re-examines anything he could find about the coming battle to make sure that the prediction would not come to pass. At the final briefing, Korax raises concerns about the lack of visibility over the drop site, but was mocked by Dorn for his caution. The Praetorian even portrayed it as cowardice in not wanting to take the battlefield in an honest fight for once. Before this escalated further, Dor threw down a sheaf of images of the planet below, taken, he said, the previous night during his unsuccessful visit to persuade Gilliman to surrender. None of his brother Primarchs would return. Korax's gaze as they filed up to start the attack on this Van Fine. The four vanguard legions landed and reported good progress, and after what seemed like an eternity of waiting, Thor gave the command for the second wave to attack, despite having discovered the images. Korax could find no fault in Dorn's plan, an orbital strike was a part of Ravenguard's favored approach, so they took to their drop pods and ships with confidence. But even before they reached the ground, it became clear that something was very wrong. They were targeted by ground fire far beyond that predicted. The jump pack equipped brethren cut to bloody shreds, and even the lightning fast drop pods meticulously blown apart by the ultramarine's defenses. Korax assembled the survivors only to be set upon not just by the ultramarines, but also Dorn's vanguard, Legion Scon turncoat, stung by the prophecy that he would run like a coward. Korax assembled what remained of his legion for an attack against their betrayer, Rogal Dorn. Time and time again, the Raven Guard struck out of the darkness at Imperial Fist command positions, and yet Dorn himself was nowhere to be found. Certain that Dorn had finally been located, Korax appealed to the World Eaters and the Emperor's children for support, only to find them making a fighting retreat to their rescue lands. 
cursing his brother Primarchs for their weakness. Korax led the remnants of his legion in a forlorn, hopeless attack into the teeth of the Imperial Fist's guns. Heavily outnumbered, they sustained hideous losses, but while their Primarch marched on, his men loyally followed to their tomb. Finally, with only a score of his brothers left around him, Korax realized what his pride had done to the Legion. He bitterly ordered the retreat, and the tattered remnants of the once mighty Raven Guard faded back to the fog of war to join the evacuation. With the Imperium alerted to Dorne's betrayal, the three broken legions evaded the traitors and paused before returning to their respective homeworlds to rebuild. Korax silently fumed, not only at the traitors, but his allies, for not supporting his final catastrophic attack upon Rogaldor. He was certain that if they had followed his lead, they could have killed the great betrayer and ended his treachery there and then. This resentment only deepened as the true scale of the war reached deliverance. Nothing was heard from the Legion for some years after Istvan. This in itself was not surprising as the entire Imperium was in the midst of a civil war and the Raven Guard was ever a taciturn Legion. When the Imperial forces finally investigated rumors of dark goings on in the surrounding area of space, they found not just Deliverance, but also Kiavar, completely deserted. Even the four stones which retained the atmosphere around the Raven Spire were down. The great gates flung wide and the fortress monastery exposed to the vacuum of space. The account of what happened in that dark time has been drawn from what are thought to be Korax's own words. Although their accuracy and completeness are matters of much conjecture, Korax's journal tells that in his desire to rebuild his legion, he used the kind of accelerated zygot implantation techniques used in the earliest days of the Imperium. These methods have been abandoned for good reason, as the vast majority of the test subjects proved to be grossly deformed rather than dramatically increasing their numbers. It instead resulted in the depletion of their stocks of gene seed. The lowest levels of the Raven Spire were filled with slavering monsters that became known as the Vergeld and their rhythmic hypnotic hammering against their prison walls like his shame haunted Korax wherever he went. This low ebb, Horax's dreams were again taunted by the demonic presence. It did not speak and only looked down in silent judgment upon him with those cold, dead vulture eyes. The next day, as Korax walked the corridors of the Raven Spire's waltz and happened to stare at one of the pitiful wretches penned within, he noticed the same vulture-like gaze staring mockingly back. Down the rows of Vergeld he searched, and inside each cell he found the same corruption of the soul looking back at him. Knowing what he had to do, Korax dismissed his assistance and went from cell to cell to systematically expunge his mistakes from existence. The rhythmic hammering of the creatures rose to a shuddering crescendo in the hour of the wolf, but by the dawn, it was at long last silenced. The full story of what happens later, of how Korax was deposed, and his eventual fate is far from clear. The bloody raids that brought the Imperium back to deliverance were commanded not by the Legion's Primarch, but a shadowy figure known variously as the Clone Lord, Progenitor, or even the Man Flayer. Extant records such as Korax's journal talk in glowing terms of an individual that had solved the problem with the creation of new Marines, 
although any reference of how this was achieved or the identity of the Clone Lord had been carefully removed. As Raven Guard's numbers rose, so did Korax's spirits. He took to training the new Battle Brothers and even wrote of taking a force to help in the Siege of Terra. However, this was eventually replaced by disquiet at the nature of his new marines, in particular their increased level of uncontrolled psychic abilities and the disturbing methods used to create them. After these journal entries end, although further information has been gleaned from writing on the wall of a specially constructed cell in what would have been the fortress monasteries of Hofikarian, the following was written in what was undoubtedly Korax's hand, and indeed, the Primarch's own blood. At first, I thought I was still asleep. All I could hear was the same rhythmic thumping that has haunted my dreams for so long. Then, I opened my eyes and realized I was truly in a waking nightmare. What I saw about me made the Weregeld look like beatific angels in comparison. It appears that Korax had been drugged and imprisoned by the Clone Lord as both a vital source of genetic material and a cruel demonstration of what his legion was becoming. Korax went to describe in painful detail how the Clone War Lord went about preventing his genetical legacy and repeatedly chastised himself for a willful blindness of how his new brothers had been created. He told of the breeding of monsters, the forerunners of those who would go on to become all too familiar, opponents of the loyal legions, through blasphemous rites. Their natural psychic potential was dramatically enhanced, turning the most skilled into sorcerers, able to effortlessly manipulate the powers of the warp. The majority were only able to use their latent powers to reconfigure their own bodies, and to a lesser extent, their armor and weapons. For these abominations, form follows desire. Fingers mold into talons, nascent wings are extruded to lift them aloft. The failures and those unable to control the changes they invite upon themselves become little more than a more of Remainder of Korax's writings become ever more incoherent as imprisonment, realization, and whatever experiments the Clone Lord subjected to him took their toll. The final marking, drawn in blood, was a simple representation of a raven. What ultimately became of Korax is unknown. When the Imperium came to investigate Deliverance, the door of the prison cell was open, and no body was ever found. At first, it was thought that rapid decompression in the fortress monastery's four stone failed and vented all its occupants into space, but the rest of Deliverance and Kiava were similarly deserted. The Imperium had recorded 17 different instances of Raven Guard warlords and demon princes claiming to be Korax, but all have been discredited over the millennia. As the corruptor of one of the Emperor's loyal legions, much time and effort has gone into establishing the real identity and fate of the Clone War. Though after 10,000 years, the trail has grown cold. No one by that name has been associated with the Raven God since they fled deliverance, although he could have easily have taken another. In the wake of Dorne's heresy, the corrupted Raven God 
flood their whole moon of deliverance and scatter to the whims of the warp. While many of the traitor legions gravitated to the Eye of Terror to craft demon worlds in their own images, the Raven God rejected such stagnation and have never been observed to stay in one place for long. Instead, they endlessly move from planet to planet and from place to place, following the unfathomable whims of Zeech, their dark god of endless change. Anywhere touched by their foul presence is never the same again, as crops grow twisted and insanity and mutation run rampant. Investigations by the Adeptus Mechanicus, Thousand Sons and the Ecclesiarchy have each put forward theories to explain these phenomena, yet none have been able to effectively combat the corruption purging the area with fire and sowing the ground with salt seems to be the only way to prevent fertile loyal imperial subjects from becoming corrupted. For all the many changes that their corruption had wrought, they retain their Primarch's ability to cripple an enemy before they even know they are fighting. In the centuries following their fall, the Raven Guard carry out raids on desperate targets that left Imperial commanders bemused. While they had been bloody and militarily successful, the targets themselves were unusual, leaving other, much higher priority locations untouched. Initially, it was attributed to the inevitable insanity associated with the worship of chaos. In time, though, it became clear that these small, seemingly unconnected attacks were part of something far more sinister. For instance, a chain of events that started with a small raid on a Prometheum refinery in Penosa Minor has been shown with nudges from the Raven Guard to have caused the loss of the entire Jotra subsector a century later. Because of this, confirmed attacks by the Raven Guard are analyzed time and time again by Imperial commanders for fear of where it might lead. Sometimes the very reinforcements and pursuit forces requested to bolster a region pays directly into their hands as defenses around the legion's true targets are drawn away and left ripe for destruction. Such are the subtle weaving of fate the Raven Guard seek to engineer. Of all the loyal legions of Astartes, the one with the best record of deflecting and thwarting the Raven Guard's vials are the Thousand Suns. Their psychic divinations have enabled them to set traps for the Raven Guard to counter their sorcerers and banish their demonic allies back to the world. This rivalry has led to titanic battles between the two legions. Although many of the worlds caught in these aferic conflagrations have been left as unthinkable husks. Sometimes, on their twisting path through the galaxy, the Raven Guard choose to take captives rather than simply kill their victims. Among those destined to become slaves and sacrifices for their dark rituals, a few may be chosen to join the Legion's ranks. Given their eldritch powers, it has been postulated that they are drawn to claim those with psychic potential, be it an isolated agri-world settlement or the depths of the Underhive. It seems that nowhere is beyond their grasp, whereas in most Legions, the creation and implantation of new marines is the responsibility of the Apothecarian. In the Raven Guard, this grisly duty is solely the domain of their sorcerers. The process is an abomination of warpcraft which transcends any mere chirurgical procedure. It wipes away the conscience and morality of the victim and opens them up to the god of change. And in doing so, unlocks their psychic potential. This horrific process unleashes an uncanny ability to twist flesh and armor so that as Korax put it, 
form follows desire, and in the most receptive individuals, produces psychics amongst the most powerful in the galaxy. The Raven Guard has retained the ability to attack without warning, where the enemy is most vulnerable, and a favorite tactic is to strike under the cover of darkness, be it True Knight or a form of Stygian gloom conjured up by their sorcerers, as befits their lightning fast ambush tactics. The Legion favors infantry over heavier vehicles. At the forefront of attacks are always their assault squads, who sweep in on sable wings before rending their victims apart with razor sharp talons. In their wake come all manner of demonic creatures spitting balefire and hate, and grossly mutated spawns that can only be directed, if not controlled by their sorcerer masters. The youngest, least mutated marines are tasked with providing a strong gun line to suppress the enemy. These brethren, whose abilities to transform their bodies and armor are yet to fully mature, fight instead with bolsters and on occasion with heavier weaponry. An over-reliance on static firepower is rare though and the role of laying down the heaviest ordnance is most often provided by the monstrous annihilators. These abominations have willingly given themselves over to demonic possession to enhance their natural abilities and are able to transform their bodies and armor into a wide array of exotic weaponry. Be it a mob of orcs or an imperial land raider, there is no target that these living tanks are unable to deal with. How the Raven Guard are able to travel so rapidly between battle zones without the aid of conventional transportation has never satisfactorily been explained by the Imperial. The most mundane theory has it that they have well camouflaged transport vehicles away from the site of the battle. In recent centuries though, Credible reports have claimed seeing Raven Guard forces both appearing out of and disappearing into thin air. This could point to their ships possessing some advanced form of mass teleportation array. Although the Raven Guard have only been observed to use the smallest types of capital ships, given the power of their sorcerers, it is possible that this ability may be warped derived or given their battles with the farseers of the Uhwe craft world, the Raven Guard may have forced access to the fabled Eldar webway. After leaving Deliverance, the Raven Guard fragmented to all intents and purposes and has never fought as a legion since. They broke into warbands called Covens and spread out to every corner of the galaxy to further their own vision of how best to serve Zinch, the god of change. These missions are frequently inexplicable, and on some occasions have led them into bloody conflict with rival covens, with a great deal of hindsight and infinite patience. Dozens of seemingly minor nudges at history by the Legion over the course of centuries have been shown to have catastrophic consequences. Imperial scholars and strategers have spent lifetimes trying to unravel the greatest meaning behind the Raven Guard's actions to, as they say, unweave the strands of fate. The Adeptus Terra conducts periodic crackdowns upon this kind of research, saying with ju some justification that such cognition is to invite only insanity and that no good can come from trying to know the mind of a chaos god. Raven Guard Covens are led on the battlefield by their greatest warriors. Although careful examination has shown that the true leaders are the sorcerers. As direct conduits to Zinch, the cabal of sorcerers guide their charges and direct them towards whatever incomprehensible mission they might be intent upon. 
The number of sorcerers in a coven varies depending upon its size and prestige, and the coven will sometimes split apart or merge with another, seemingly on a whim. According to Chief Librarian Mirren of the Thousand Suns, the success of a Ravenguard coven can be judged by its composition. Older, more established forces are composed largely of assault troops, ones that have recently split off from a larger warband or that have taken heavy losses contain more of the younger bolter armed marines that have yet to fully manifest their abilities to transform. According to Mirren, covens rarely grow beyond the hundred marines in size, not including the attendant spawns and summoning demonic entities as their style of warfare achieves with lightning strikes what others would attempt with a massed assault. The number 9 also seems to hold a fascination for them, with units composed of 9 members being particularly favored. Because of the vital role played by the sorcerers to the continued existence of the coven, on only the most critical and sensitive occasions does a senior magus venture onto the battlefield. Usually lesser members of the Cabal are sent in their stead, but such is the importance of even these individuals that they are inevitably surrounded by a cadre of brutal killers, summoned demonic entities and the hideous results of their failed genetic experiments. Outside the Cabal, Marines are given respect based upon the extent to which they can transform their bodies. The monstrous annihilators and the raven-winged assault squads are held high above their younger bolter armed brethren. Even the youngest initiates, though, look down and pity upon the amorphous spawn. These unfortunates have proved unequal of Zinch's gifts, and in doing so, have paid the price. With their sanity. The shadowy clone lord's perversion of the Raven Guard intentionally and irrevocably altered the Legion's gene seed. Not only was Korax betrayed, his genetic legacy was murdered. In addition to the usual methods of implantation, chemotherapy, and psychoindoctrination, the sorcerers of the Cabal utilize other more esoteric methods to create new brethren. Many of the original implants, such as the Micronoid, Betcher's Gland, and often the Hemastemon, are absent in the Raven Guard, while the intent of others have been changed radically and completely new ones added. These changes, in particular the drastic alterations to the Catalepsian Node, are primarily focused on enhancing psychic abilities. In true prodigies, this leads to the creation of sorcerers of incredible power, and in time can stimulate transformational abilities in others. While the remarkable ability of Ravenguard brethren to grow wings may be due in part to a hyper-stimulation of Osmodula and Biscopea, Nothing short of Warpcraft would explain the way that Ceramite and Adamantium can be reshaped at will into razor-sharp talents. Despite the seemingly infinite variety into which the Raven Guard twists themselves, one constant remains, just like their tragic betrayed Primarch. Their skin is as white as snow and their hair and eyes are black as night. If this is an immutable part of Korax's genetic heritage, or a bitter, taunting joke at his expense, only the God of Change knows for certain. And as for their battle cry, due to their chosen role in conducting ambushes, assassinations, and covert operations, the Raven Guard preferred to approach their prey silently. Instead, the Legion's motto is simply Nemo me impune la sesit. <laughs> Quoth the Raven, 
Nevermore. 